Association in causal diagrams. We're going to be discussing how I can tell whether two variables are associated in causal diagrams. Uh, technically, the technique uh, we're using is called deseparation, if you ever want to look it up. Okay, so association in causal diagrams. The easy way, so the easy way to think about it is that if there is a path between two variables, they are associated. Uh, so for example, I might have A go to L. So in this case, uh, perhaps you have some sort of uh, heart transplant. Um, this transplant might uh, affect the, the blood chemical levels in somebody, and this might be a measured variable L, uh, which would affect the outcome of survival days. So in this case, A and Y are causally linked, uh, because in this case there is a path. There's arrows pointing from A to L and then L to Y. So there's a path between them. The first rule, however, so that's the general rule uh, that, that, that basically holds true everywhere. However, there are a couple of exceptions. So the first rule, the sort of exception to this rule, is if there is something conditioned in between these two variables, so between A and Y, there's a conditioned on variable L. Then in this case, there is no association between A and Y. What do I mean? This seems like a pretty weird rule. Uh, the idea here is that, yeah, A actually does have a causal effect on Y. So why would I say it's not associated if I'm just, quote unquote, conditioning on L? So do we remember what conditioning means? Conditioning in this case means that I'll separate all the values of L into their own distinct piles. And then I will look at those distinct piles and what their values of Y might entail. Okay, interesting. But the idea here is that if A affects L, then those values of L will differ. However, if I separate each different L into its own pile, those differences caused by A will be completely eliminated. And in that case, I will no longer see any effect on Y. That is, after I separate them into piles. So this is why conditioning, in effect, eliminates this causal effect. Hmm. Okay. First rule done. Second rule, uh, this should also make sense. So I've got some sort of A, again, some sort of treatment that might affect something else, in this case an L. I'm not going to condition upon this L, this observed variable. And then I've got Y, but in this case, instead of L affecting Y, I'll say Y affects L. Okay, this might make sense to you. In this case, we've got some variable A that affects a variable L, and some variable Y that affects that same variable L. So for example, A might be blood alcohol level, and Y might be driving skill, and then L might be whether someone gets into a crash. Okay, So just because uh, both the blood alcohol level and driving skill affect whether someone gets into a crash doesn't mean that blood alcohol level and driving skill are actually related. Uh, so the second rule in association and causal diagrams is if the path is blocked by two arrows going into the same variable, uh, or the path is blocked when two arrows go into the same variable. Okay, second rule done. Third rule. The third rule is actually one of the most complicated rules here. This third rule is, again, fairly simple. You've got an A, it affects an L, and then we have an L which is affected uh, by a Y. So it looks very similar to the above rule. The only difference is in this case, let me condition upon this L. So what do you think happens here? Is A associated with Y now? The interesting thing is that it is. Uh, these two rules kind of together, so in this case, both of these block above. So we've got uh, block, uh, block. This one is allowed, so this one is open. So the causal link is open. So in this case, uh, A affects some L, Y affects some L, and just because we condition upon L, then we know that A and Y are related. So I'm going to give you two ways to think about this. Uh, the first way to think about it is again with blood alcohol level and driver skill. So let's say someone has, uh, well, let's say someone has a really good driver skill. Let's say we don't know someone's blood alcohol level. And let's say we've conditioned upon L, so we know L. So let's say we know that L, in this case, is in the crash. So we've separated it out in terms of crash and non-crash. 
So in the crashed example, what do we think about A's blood alcohol level? Is it likely that it's high or low? Well, in this case, it's probably likely that it's high. We know the driver is really quite good, so we know the driver is already quite good. It's very unlikely that, he, that they'd get into a crash unless they had very high blood alcohol level. And vice versa, you can think about this. So because we know information about L, since we know information about the, uh, the common cause of both A and Y, both A and Y are related. They are associated. The second way I do like to think about these, uh, and this helps out especially in very large diagrams, is that I like to think about them with uh, simple, and excuse me for those that aren't sort of like computer science -y people out there, but this sort of helps me. I like to think of them as simple like switches in this case. Um, so I like to think about A as sending a signal, a single bit signal, uh, Y as sending a single bit signal. So A is either on or off, Y is either on or off. And then L, in this case, we know L is uh, some sort of output from a two-bit signal. So I like to think of L as like an XOR, okay? So in this case, we would know sort of full information. Now, what do I mean? So if I know Y was one, and I know the output of the XOR was a zero, then I'd have to know that A was also one. If I knew that Y was zero, the output of the XOR was one, I'd have to know that A was zero. Okay, I'm not sure if this will help anyone, uh, but I do like this sort of description. It makes a lot of sense for me. And if you understand what, uh, what some simple binary logic stuff is, that might help as well. Okay, on to the final example. This is example number four. So again, this will look incredibly similar. Uh, we have some sort of A. We have uh, some sort of, uh, in this case, uh, L. Uh, we have L is affected by some sort of Y as well. Except for instead of conditioning upon L, I condition upon one of L's descendants. So in this case, I condition upon L2, whereas I already have L1. So I'll condition upon this guy. So what do you think? Is this open or is this closed? Well, you probably have guessed it. It is open or else I probably wouldn't uh, cite it as an example. So this is also an open path. So this one doesn't come up too often, but if you condition upon one of the descendants of one of the blockers of a path that was closed, that path will become open. And so A and Y will become associated. Um, again, you can think about very similar examples to above. Uh, so instead of looking at L, which is uh, the driver whether they crashed or not, maybe think of L1 is whether they crashed or not, and L2 being the insurance fees. So if we knew the insurance fees, well, we know whether they crashed or not, and therefore we can do the same little XOR exercise or the same logical exercise as before. Okay, so these are all the things, all the tools you need to know whether there is association in a causal diagram. Now the question you might be asking is, well, well, Nate, uh, why, why does this really matter? Uh, like causal diagrams seem pretty cool, uh, but I don't really see their relevance in statistics just quite yet. Well, next time I want to show you how you can use them quite effectively in causal inference.